I can couple or uncouple any time. So when he asked about switching to next week, I said, okay, I'll just be my message that I was going to be. Thank you for such a sweet spirit this morning. You know, in trying to start out with something a little bit funny, there was a 12-year-old boy who had invited one of his friends to church. His friend had never been to church before, and he said, you can spend a night over at my house, and in the morning we'll get up and we'll go to church. So the little boy brought his stuff, and he was nervous about going to church. This is his first time. Not only was it his first time, but he was going to a Baptist church. And the 12-year-old boy said to his friend, he said, you know what? I'm not going to know what's going on, so you're going to have to explain it to me. So they got to church, the little 12-year-old boy, his eyes were the size of quarters. This was the first time he had been to church, let alone a Baptist church. And the congregational uh, leader of singing stepped forward. And he did this to the congregation, and the little boy said, what does that mean? He said, that means he wants us to stand. At the end of the song, after they got through singing, the person who was leading the congregational songs did like this. He said, what does that mean? He said, that means we're to sit down. A little while later, he turned to the choir, and they were fixing to sing, and he did this to the choir. And he said, what does that mean? He said, that means he wants the um, choir members to stand. A little while later, they did this. They were going to receive an offering, and he said, what does that mean? He said, he wants the ushers to come forward. Well, the preacher got up there, and he got ready to preach. He brought his Bible. He looked at his watch. He took it off. He even wound it and put it on the pulpit. The 12-year-old boy said to him, what does that mean? He said, don't be fooled. That don't mean a thing. A person, teenager, is told in high school to follow their dreams. The same individual in college is told to follow their dreams. That individual now has multiple restraining orders. Things that children ask their mom. They say, Mom, where is my phone? Mom, where is the remote? Mom, what's for dinner? Mom, why can't animals talk? Where are my keys? Things that children ask their dads. Where's mom? In your Bibles, take and turn to the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. We hit this a little bit last week. We want to go into the third lesson of the genius of generosity. Week number one, we talked about the Macedonian church and how that they were generous in spite of their circumstances. And the truth to us is in spite of our circumstances, we are to learn to be generous. The Macedonian church were in deep poverty and great affliction, and yet they knew that the Jews, the Christian Jews in Jerusalem, when a person is a Christian and they are a Jew, we call it that they are a Messianic Jew, and they were really going through it. And so they began to take up offering, they began to um, do a work. You know, we found out the first week that God loves a cheerful giver. Then secondly, the first week we found out that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And we found out that the Macedonian church, even though that they were struggling, they had joy in their giving. And not only did they have joy in their giving, they were enthusiastically excited about giving. They considered themselves to be stewards of what God had given them. 
Now, last week, we talked about um, several reasons why people aren't generous. Number one, they have never been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. They may be Christian in name, but they've never been Christian um, in being converted to Christ. Maybe they're not convinced that God is good. Maybe they're not committed. You know, it's funny when we uh, talk to our children, um, we want them to go in. If you're playing a sport, if you're playing soccer, if you're playing basketball, whatever you're doing, do it at 100%. But yet a lot of times... People don't give because they're just not committed to the church. And then here's another thing, reason we talked about last week. A lot of times they're not concerned. We talked about last week how that over 2 billion people in the world have never even heard of Jesus Christ. Let alone given the gospel enough so that they can understand it and be able to to make a decision on who Christ was. Studies have shown that the average Christian in the average church gives to the church on the average of 2 to 3% of their income. Now, I would think and I believe that our church is above average in that, but I do believe that Scripture sets a higher standard for the people of God. You know, when you talk and when you preach about being stewards of your time, many people start to discuss, how can I get more involved in church? How can I make my time count for the Lord? And they look for other opportunities. When we talk about the importance of being a a steward of your talents, People start to uh, find out what their spiritual gifts are. And how can I use my gifts that God has given me? And everyone this morning who names the name of Christ, who has been born again, has been given at least one spiritual gift, sometimes two, sometimes three, to be able to build up the church. And so when you talk about being a steward, Of your talents, people get involved and try to figure out what their spiritual gifts are so that they can use them. But when you talk about being a steward of your treasures, people get defensive and protective. You know, let me just say this this morning. You can put up your wallets. We've already received an offering. We're not taking an offering. And by the way, I don't want you to give, but I think it's important for Christians to understand and have the right principle and right understanding of this doctrine of giving. I'm not so certain that preachers along the way have preached this doctrine wrong. They have beaten people up with this thing about giving, where actually it ought to be a privilege and an honor and a joy to be able to use the resources that God has given us to be able to make a difference in the world. Money oftentimes becomes the best representation of our values and our priorities. It is evident of what you and I truly believe. Our money represents this morning who we are. God's prescription for the church, I believe with all of my heart, is a tithe. And there's a lot of people who don't understand the word tithe. Somebody says to me, I tithe 5% of my income. I'm thinking that doesn't even make sense because the word tithe means a tenth. In the Old Testament, They, a lot of times, did not, they used bartering systems. They may not have had as much coins and as much money physically as we do. And so a lot of times, they would barter and they would use, and when it came to giving, they would give of their crops as God had increased them. They would do more of a bartering type of system. For example, 
if you had a friend and they came on over and they plowed your garden or worked in your garden, you might give them a sheep. You might be able to barter that way. And um, as we get into Scripture, we find out, and I believe you cannot read Scripture without coming to the conclusion that as a result of God's giving to us, God expects us to give. And it was in the Old Testament a tenth at least of what came in. What does that mean, Brother George? Let's say at the beginning of the year, let's say you had 100 cows and at the end of the year, God had blessed you and you had 150 cows. Of that increase of 50, you were expected to give God five. If it was sheep and at the beginning of the year, you started out with uh, 200 sheep. And then throughout the year, God had blessed you and you now had 300 sheep. You were expected to honor God with your giving by giving 10 because there was an increase of 100. The tithe was to be the first fruits and the best fruits. Every time the children of Israel got in trouble, it's because they start to, started to withhold or to give God the worst that they had. For example, let's say you had um, had 10 cows born unto you during that calendar year. And one of the cows was lame. And you thought to yourself, I can't sell this cow. A lot of times the children of Israel said, well, I can't sell this, I can't make money, so let's give it to God. And God said, you wouldn't do that to a leader. You wouldn't do that to a king. And yet you expect me to be okay with it. In the Old Testament, when Israel was faithful in their giving or in their tithing to God, God blessed the people. He gave them an abundance. He gave them rain when they needed rain for their crops. And when they were not faithful, you'll find out that the blessings stopped. The extra. The children of Israel not only gave a tithe, but all, oftentimes once a year they would give a second tithe. According to Deuteronomy chapter 14, it was called a festival tithe. So basically, now you're up to about 20% of the way of the increase that the Lord had increased the children of Israel. Now, Every three years, the children of Israel were asked to give another tithe. So basically, if you want to put this down to numbers, you talk about the first, the first uh, group of tithing, you talk about the festival tithe, you talk about an extra tithe that was given every three years, you're talking about 23.3% they were giving. Now, let's be honest. Back then, they didn't have state and federal taxes. They might have had some other light taxes, but they weren't paying for Social Security. They weren't probably pa paying a property tax. They weren't after they had received their checks and had everything taken out. Then they didn't go to the grocery store and then receive a tax on top of what they bought or go to put gas in their car, not that they had cars, but then had gas uh, tax added to that. So you say, Brother George, what is sufficient? I've often been asked this, Brother George, do I pay tithe on my gross pay or on my net pay? To which I often respond, do you want God to bless you on your gross or on your net. And that pretty much settles that. The children of Israel, as we get into Malachi 3, the children of Israel had moved back from Jer to Jerusalem from the Medo-Persian Empire, which was at one time the Babylonian Empire. And yet even though they had moved back and were thankful to have moved back, 
they were still neglecting their giving to the temple. They wanted God to bless them, but yet they were neglecting God's word. And so what Malachi does in Malachi chapter 3, he reminds the people and rebukes them. Now let me say this to you this morning. The tithe or tithing and the principle of it is not a necessarily a money-raising tool. It is, however, a people-raising tool. The children of Israel, when they left out of Egypt, they wound up wandering in the wilderness around a certain mountain for years, for 40 years. And what God was trying to get them to understand is you've got to be obedient and you've got to learn to trust me. Tithing allows us to simply trust God. A familiar scripture, because we touched on it a little bit last week. Flip on in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 7, and we'll read down to verse 12. And then I want to give you just about six or seven things real quickly. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances. That is God speaking to the children of Israel. And have not kept them. Return unto me. And I will return unto you. The ball's in your court. Saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said wherein shall we return? Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me God says. But ye say wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes. And offerings, verse 9. And because of that, ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Look at verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And then he says this, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I like the way that Dave Ramsey talks about rebuking the devourer. Just picture if you have a Chevrolet, you're probably going to have problems. No, I'm teasing. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But picture a little demon. And he's in there. And he's got his pickaxe and he's working on your engine, your transmission. And he is beating that thing. And it's just a matter of time before you have transmission problems. And what happens, picture now, theologically, don't think that this is a theological illustration, but the principle is there. Little demon, big angel. And God sends this angel, and he said, there's a fellow who's been honoring God in his giving, and there he's got a little demon that's working on the transmission of his Chevrolet truck. Go take care of him. And that big angel comes, and I kind of picture it as like frog gigging or flounder gigging. And that big old angel says, come here, old boy. (coughs) To that demon and said, that man's been honoring me and everything. You get out of here. You get leave his stuff alone. But the scripture says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast forth her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts. And look at verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Can I tell you something this morning, church? When you and I tithe, 
It's a way of putting God first in our lives. The children of Israel were pretending to be faithful to God, but they were not. They were giving to God their leftovers. They were giving to God blemished sacrifices. They were saying, God, bless me. And God was saying, I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. But you haven't done what I have said to do. Look at verse 14. Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it? That we have kept his ordinances. Basically, they were thinking to themselves, why give? Why honor God? We're still struggling. Can I tell you something? When you give and when you honor God, it doesn't exempt you from problems. But it also doesn't mean that hundreds of dollars of bills are going to fly at your feet. You're still going to go through struggles. You're still going to go through tough times. But I can guarantee you that over a lifetime, over years, the person who has honored God will be blessed. Why? Because they're putting God first in their life. You know, so many times we're like the young boy. His grandfather gave him 25, uh, two quarters, 25 cents each. And he said, when you go to church... Take the first 25 cents and put it in the offering plate and honor God. And the other 25 cents is yours so that you can buy some candy, so that you can buy some a sucker or something like that. On his way to church, the little boy had one of the two quarters slip out of his hand and it went down the storm drain. And he said, oops, there goes God's quarter. And that's what we do a lot of times. Secondly, when we tithe, we prove God's promises. Tithing is not only a test for me, but it's also to prove God. God says in verse 10, prove me now, herewith saith the Lord. Many people are surprised to find out that when they learn the principle of tithing and honoring God with what he has prospered you, that you will do better off on 90% than you will do on 100%. I've told you the story of R.G. Letourneau. R.G. Letourneau was a Christian man. And R.G. Letourneau went ahead and honored God in his giving. And yet he had two businesses to go bankrupt. He sat down and he had a talk with God. And he said, God, for somehow, for some reason, you make it work off a of 10%. He said, God, starting today, I'm going to start giving to you 90% of whatever I make. And I'm going to learn to live off a of 10%. Well, R.G. Letourneau, when he died, he had over 299 patents related to his earth-moving equipment. And he was, he uh, designed and implemented manufacturing processes and machines and tools. And he was one of the biggest, most wealthiest people of his day because he decided, I'm just going to honor God. In my giving, when we tithe, we prove God's promises. Thirdly, when we tithe, we profit from God's provisions. You know, there's several provisions that you and I, as we go through life, can enjoy. We can enjoy personal blessings. The Bible says, I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out. So there's personal blessings. But then there's also material blessings. More than you can contain or more than we can contain. Your barns shall be filled to the overflowing. So there's personal blessings. There's material blessings. There's protective blessings. God said, I'll rebuke the devourer. That thing that's trying to destroy you. I will rebuke it. 
He said, there's also spiritual blessings. And then the Bible teaches us that there's national blessings when we learn to honor God in our giving. It says here that all nations, look at verse 12, and all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. When the children of Israel learned the importance of giving and honoring God with how he had prospered them, he said there's going to be some personal blessings, there's going to be some material blessings, there's going to be a protective blessing, there's going to be spiritual blessings, and there's going to be a blessing nationwide. Now we know now that was written primarily for Jews. And we know that righteousness exalts a nation. But any nation that decides to put the God of heaven first, God exalts them and God blesses them. Fourthly, when we tithe, we praise God's name. It's been sweet in here this morning and some of the testimonies have been sweet. But one of the greatest things of praise that we can do And like I said, I'm not trying to take up an offering. I want you to understand the blessings and the joy that there is in giving. You know, a lot of preachers talk about, oh, you didn't give. I wonder you're going through kidney stones or something like that. God's just trying to get the tithe out of you. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that illustration. But if I was God... If I was God and I wanted to get somebody, I'd give them a kidney stone. Been there, done that twice. You start confessing everything. Sorry, God, I'll do, I go to the mission field, I'll do this, that, the other. But here's the thing. God wants to bless us. And God says, when you give, Of the way that you have been prospered. It honors me. It says you trust me. It's a way that you praise God's name. Tithing is just another way to honor God. And when we obey God's word. We honor and praise God's name. Fifthly. When we tithe. We personalize God's word. What does that mean, Brother George? Oftentimes, I try to put myself in certain stories in Scripture. For example, it's a hot, dry, dusty day, and everywhere you walk, there's a little cloud of dust. And Nebuchadnezzar has set up a 90-foot image in the plains of Dora. And he said, when the music starts to play, You are going to fall down on your knees and you're going to worship that golden image. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing there right beside me. And Shadrach said, I ain't ain't bowing. Meshach says, I ain't bowing. Abednego looks at me and says, you going to bow? I don't know about you. But when we honor God, we praise him. And we say, your word is real. I'm going to honor you. I want to be a friend. I want to be obedient. God's word, listen to me. God's word is either true or it's not true. And I can say I believe it, but do I obey it? And so when we tithe we personalize God's word we say it's real and it's good for me sixthly when we tithe we practice godliness what does that mean brother George do you know we were discussing this a couple of weeks ago over in the connect class there was a question are preachers supposed to wear robes because there's a lot of denominations they wear robes do you have to have a special degree or something like that to wear a robe And I talked to myself, no. One Sunday morning, who knows, maybe I'll show up in a robe with one of them things and my collar turned around backwards. 
And you'll say, man, he's really holy. No, no, I'll still be old brother George. God gives us leeway. I just decided to wear a jacket and pair of pants and shirt today. Scripture doesn't say that we are to have Connect class on Tuesday nights. And scripture doesn't say anything about Wednesday night prayer meeting. It doesn't say how often we are to observe communion other than the fact it says as oft as you do. See, when it comes to giving and tithing, you know, there's a lot of things in Scripture that we're given freedom to do. But there's, when you read Scripture, you understand God expects His children to give. And it ought to start out with a certain amount. And when we tithe, we practice godliness. When we choose to give, we're practicing God's word. Seventhly, when we tithe, we participate in God's work. There's just something powerful about pooling resources. And by pooling resources, you're able to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. We're able to help people in the community. We've got a group, I've said, that's going on a mission trip. We've been able to help those people who are planning on going on that mission trip in a way that other churches can't. Why? Because our people have learned the principle of just simply honoring God in their giving. We're able to pool our resources. We're able to help people in China Grove. We're able to help people in Landis. Uh, We're able to give to food banks. We're able to help pregnancy centers. We're able to help missionaries by pooling our money together. So when we tithe, we participate in God's work. You know, it's a strange coincidence, and I've seen some people, and their mindset was they probably had a gift of this, but God expects all of us to give. And I've seen people who had inherited $200,000, and I've seen them show up at the church and say, in essence, Brother George, we want to write the church a check for $21,000. I don't know about you, but when I saw that check the first time, I'm thinking, Man, that would be so cool to be able to write a check, $21,000. You know, it's just a coincidence that that same individual, five or six years later, they received a second inheritance. Go figure. But it was five or six times as much as their first inheritance. And they were looking for a ministry to be able to park like $135,000. And I said, that's just a coincidence. No. God blesses his children. And when his children learn the importance of giving, God shows them and uses them as a transformer. And he blesses them on one side. So that they can make a difference on the other hand. I don't know about you, but when we tithe, we participate in God's work. Can I tell you something this morning? Giving can make people nervous. People can hold on to their wallets and say, nope. Preacher, not getting my money. I don't want your money. Can I tell you something? We don't need your, well, I guess eventually we do. (laughs) But that's not the reason for this message. There is joy in your giving. And I find this out with my own children because I love them and we do kind acts for them. It's joyous. It does my heart good. It tenderizes my heart 
when I have the opportunity to meet a need. Giving makes you more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, help these people to understand that I'm not leaning heavily on anybody, but Father, 